Professor Dr. Deepam Kordutto. Please come to the dais and present him. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for uh, basically inviting me and uh, probably I am the only constant for all the workshops. So uh, uh, originally, ancestrally, this is my hometown actually. Uh, Dhaka, Vikrampur and Horikpur. So always, it is actually a uh, Narit uh, town. So I am extremely happy to be here and honored and at a Bhalawasha Jaga. Without much ado, I had kept my talk, basically presentation in such way. After a wonderful uh, presentation by Dr. Jogesh, uh, Dr. Shandip Pansal and uh, Dr. Srivash Kishor and a beautiful life surgery by Koshet sir. I would like to basically uh, share with you the protocols and decision making for sleep apnea surgery. Which surgery when, kind of, with some short videos in hyperlapse, timeless mode because of paucity of time. So soft tissue surgery or skeletal surgery? Protocols and decision making. So in 1981, continuous positive airway pressure was considered the, apparently the gold standard treatment of obstructive sleep apnea by Colin Sullivan and group. But in spite of the best possible efforts, in spite of the best possible efforts on the part of the doctors, by the sleep technicians, our patients, in spite of best possible motivation, the long-term compliance of CPAP is actually ranging from 29 to 83%. Just like what Dr. Sinivashkis has told, not only surgeries, not only our soft tissue sleep apnea surgeries, even the septoplasty, the success rate is anything between 40 to 60. The CPAP, apparently the gold standard, its success rate is even as low as 29% in many patients. So surgery has a role. The unanswered questions are, which structures appear obstructive or collapsible? And number two, which truly needs treatment to improve the patient's status with least morbidity. So, container or the content, we all know that is a big dilemma and that is the, actually the uh, background of my uh, presentation. Soft tissue are the contents and the skeletal component is the container. So, which to address, content or container? There are plenty of publications and citations with advanced palatopharyngoplasty techniques, need of multiple structural surgery is reduced. And AHI floor, we call it AHI floor, that is at which level, be it after surgery or any other procedures, the AHI should come down. The AHI floor for most of the upper airway surgery publications is actually, it is in the teens. It is in the teens, that is 13 to 19, not less than 5, never. Just with combination of soft tissue surgeries, we can go as low as at the level of teens. So patients seek improvement in quality of life with less medical risk. So QL is actually the upcoming issue, not the AHI. We are telling it repeatedly since morning. Now in this publication, the conclusion is AHI outcome after palatopharyngoplasty is stratified by no obstruction, partial or no obstruction and complete obstruction of tongue basin dies and in this publication, our friend, our international friend, Professor Ofar Jakovic, in this publication, he has showed that the 
just with drug induced sleep endoscopy staging pattern correlate with outcome of advanced phalangoplasty? Is it actually a myth or reality? We are looking forward to listening from Dr. Srinivas Kishore tomorrow. By our another great friend, Professor Michel Kahali from Brazil, he is probably currently in the seventh generation, right, Dr. Srinivas? Seventh generation. Seventh, seventh generation palliative phalangoplasty. That means he is modifying. When someone is modifying his own techniques, that means we are missing out something probably. So this need, it needs to be needs some introspection, but lateral pharyngoplasty versus ugular pharyngoplasty, in this paper, his conclusion was lateral pharyngoplasty produces better clinical and polysonographic outcomes. So what Dr. Shondip has also told, what Dr. Khorshet sir has shown, not, not just classical ugular palliative pharyngoplasty, actually we are coming out of that. The lateral wall collapse was previously unaddressed. Nowadays, our sleep endoscopic philosophy, we are addressing the lateral pharyngeal wall. That needs to be addressed because in most of our dice findings, we see there is a significant level of lateral collapse. And Professor Kenny Pang and our friend Dr. Uh, Takar Utsan, their expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty, a new technique, their publication during 2014, so during 2007 actually, their conclusion was the ESP may offer benefits in a select group of OSA patients. By Professor our Doyne, Professor Claudio Vichnissers, is barf reposition pharyngoplasty for OSA, a feasibility, safety, efficacy and teachability pilot study. He also had shown some modifications, how barf had, he first proposed it and there were subsequent many modifications as Dr. Srinivas has told. Professor Michael Friedman, Jita Palatoplasty, a technique for patients without tonsils. Conclusion was, a modified technique for patients without tonsils who have OSA is presented there, and their new technique is more successful with acceptable morbidity for patients with OSA than classical technique they are finding. Now, just to share with you few videos and the philosophies, we all know in most of the cases, just leaving behind the complicated syndromic babies or some skeletally malformed babies, most of our pediatric sleep apnea is nothing but tonsil adenoid hypertrophy. And we get this kind of babies. We ask our, because in most of the cases, be, be practical, we have to be practical. We cannot advise polysonography for our pediatric patients in most of the times because when to recommend PSG for a pediatric patient, there are clear cut guidelines, completely a different presentation. I am not elaborating on that. But we ask our patients, that is, kids, parents, to come up with such kind of videos. And what we do? We do basically classical bilateral tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. So I use coblation. It can be done with monopolar diathermy or radio frequency, no problem. Even, even uh, the cold steel technique, that is cold steel followed by the bipolar, that is also uh, practiced. And it is ultimately the man behind the machine and philosophy, not the tool. So, regarding adenoidectomy, it is normally more or less accepted that rather than adenoid curate, we are actually standardized and routinely we do by population. And this kind of uh, comfort, this kind of result and postoperative, no mobility practically, morning admission, evening go, and almost from the next day onwards, school or activity join. So, coblation is probably uh, the unanimous choice for adenoid. Uh, maybe for tonsil, there might be some person to person variations, but I guess from, from adenoid point of view, coblation is the tool. And this is the postoperative video of the same patient, peaceful sleep, no more snoring, no more chest injury, no more mouth breathing, gasping, nothing. So this much of rewarding result we get by almost in our 80 to 90 percent of pediatric sleep apnea patients. Now regarding expansion, candidacy, CPAP non-compliant patients, we have to understand that today's morning life surgery also Dr. Khurshit Pujinda sir actually skipped that page 
there was a page of CPAP trial I have seen because I was there in the theater. That patient also received CPAP trial. Usually from medical legal point of view, except barring a few, barring a few significant surgical structural uh, um, uh, issues, before jumping upon any kind of soft tissue, sleep apnea surgery, at least have a record of CPAP trial for at least seven days. It is my, my, my suggestion, if not one month. From significant skeletal morbidity like, like uh, septum, tonsil, adenoid, you may not do it. But definitely, you shouldn't do it. You, you, you need not to do it. But before taking the patient to the theater for any soft tissue sleep apnea surgery, keep a CPAP data. And CPAP non-compliance is actually what is validated. The yes, we can take the patient for soft tissue surgery for OSA. So, the candidacy point of view, the expansion sphincter fibroblastic, CPAP non-compliant patients with small tonsil, like tonsil size 1 and 2, BMI less than 35, Friedman clinical staging 2 and 3, and bulky, thick, lateral pharyngeal wall. They are candidates for expansion. And what do we do? Let me skip the DICE video for paucity of time. So here, after the bilateral tonsillectomy, there is a classical expansion sphincter pedicoplasty of Kenny Bank and Taka Nusson, what they proposed during 2007. And after that, there are plenty of variations. I have not kept any relocation video here because Dr. Shondi Ponsal has already shared that video with you. Dr. Koshesar has shown you the video. Here, we do after bilateral tonsillectomy, we just elevate the palatopharyngeus muscle bulk because the prerequisite of this surgery is to have a good muscle lateral pharyngeal wall bulk. So we elevate the palatal pharyngeal muscle bulk from the base, pedicled upwards, and we create a tunnel, submucosal tunnel under the palate at the level of the pterygoid hemulus. And we just insert a right angle forcep and we catch hold of the elevated palatal pharyngeal muscle bulk and we just pull it up, resulting in after the scar formation, an anterior superior lateral vector. So, idea is to create a width and depth enhancement. Because that is the mantra. In any case, we have to reduce the peak rate. Now, treatment options for failure. If ESP fails, then what? Revision lateral pharyngoplasty with or without palatoplasty and zeta. Now, barb pharyngoplasty. Again, I may skip the video, but the candidacy. Who are the candidates of barb? Retropalatal collapse on dice, an excessive bulk of palate and or lateral pharyngeal wall. An absolute exclusion criteria for barb is previous palatal surgery. My message. If already some kind of palatal surgery is done by either you or any of your previous colleague, absolutely don't ever think of doing barb in this candidate. So, again, this is the hyperlap timeless video because of paucity of time. This is a classical technique as proposed by Professor Claudio Vigini, sir. The idea is leaving behind no knot as so open what I was telling in the morning. So less pain, minimum morbidity, at least three forward and reverse suture. Idea is to create a tightening and fibrotic scar at the level of the hanging soft palate. Now treatment option for failure. If bar fell, then what? And what I am talking about here is definitely Dr. Shondi Bansal has told, if the patient is happy, failure, there are two terms. From our perspective, failure, that is AHI dominated, or if patient's perspective, that is quality of life dominated. If in here to avert the to confusion, I am talking about suppose this surgery fails, then what? Then Zeta is an option. Whether the patient will actually look for the second lip surgery or not, that is altogether a different debate. 
Now, what is zeta? Because we have already seen, if any kind of minimally invasive soft tissue surgery in the palate fails, then zeta is a good option. So who are the candidates? Number one, patient with or without tonsils. Number two, very thick or very thin soft palate with bulky or thin lateral pharyngeal wall. Complete concentric collapse at the level of velum and oropharynx. And patients already undergone previous conservative palatal surgery like classical UTBP. They are wonderful candidates for Zeta. And what we do here? Again, surgery starts with bilateral tonsillectomy. And we have to measure the palatal dimple because apparently Zeta is a bit more aggressive procedure in comparison to any kind of soft tissue procedure, but it is a wonderful soft tissue surgery, probably one of the best rewarding surgery from outcome, surgical success point of view among all soft tissue surgeries. But it is a bit more invasive, but not that much, provided for the proper counseling is there. And we respect the anatomy, that is the palatal dimple. We measure the depth and the width. And we all know the critical closing pressure or intraluminal pressure in any collapsible airway, be it upper airway or in any physical matters in engineering, as per the Poissonis law, the intraluminal pressure is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius of the uh, uh, tube. So, if we enhance the intraluminal diameter just by double, we make it double, resulting in there is 16 times reduction of the pressure. So, here we are marking it and the marking is actually the base of the uvula and the junction of the hot palate and soft palate and the midpoint of the, those two points that is we join the base of the uvula and the junction of the hot palate and soft palate this is the junction of the hot palate and soft palate and the midpoint of this line almost approximately corresponds with that of the palatal dimple which is our proximal limitation we shouldn't go proximal to it marking is very important and the suture that is Two-layer suture is actually a. Uh, it requires patience. It requires patience and a very good surgical assistance because symmetrical pull from both sides is absolutely mandatory because you are holding your instrument in one hand. You are holding the hemi palate, that is the uvula or palate, in your another hand, and the symmetrical pull. You will show. You will see in a minute. Symmetrical pull of the two hemi uvula and hemi palate, it should be symmetrical. It's a very good synchronized surgical assistance is absolutely mandatory. And this is the butterfly. We can go as lateral as possible till up to uh, telecomandibular raphe, but we shouldn't go proximal to palatal dimple. This is the typical butterfly of the soft palate in Zeta is a very favorite technique of mine because I get consistently good result in last 10 years And now we measure you can see the lateral dimension imagine the tonsils are still there the lateral dimension is 1.5 centimeter and the depth that is from the base of the uvula up to the posterior pharyngeal wall is just 0.5 centimeter it is the lateral width after tonsil removal so when the tonsils were in situ, the width of the upper airway was just 1.5 cm and the depth is 0.5 cm.
let me fast forward it. This is exactly what I was telling you. Just splitting, the splitting the uvula and the soft palate into equal two halves, that is creating two hemipalatal flaps. And jolly well we can use monopolar diathermy or radio frequency at this step. Never ever use oblation at this step because it will eat up the tissue. We don't want any volumetric reduction at this step. So use your monopolar pottery or radio frequency. We are assessing whether we can go further. Let me fast forward it. Now at this step, we need to freshen. We need to freshen up the mucosal layer up to and the minor salivary gland layer up to the muscle level. So we need to expose the muscle and invariably usually at this point we encounter a bleeding. To give a life surgical feel I have not edited this. Almost always we encounter a bleeder here and it is just a matter of second to seal it. Then we can assess you, we can go even more further because we have already marked the palatal temple. It is not a very tough procedure. It is a very good procedure and I am giving the first layer that is the anchoring sutures by 30 PDS. That is my favorite suture. What I have learned from my cleft lip and cleft palate surgical colleagues. These are the anchoring first layer stitches. Then we can assess, we can trim, I even meet a bit more further. And now the second layer stitch, either by PDS or you can give it by 30 Vicryl. Absolutely no bare area. All the sutures are nicely placed, leaving behind no raw area totally covered and at the end you will see this is the lateral width and the depth we had achieved and when we will measure it is almost 3 cm that is double and the vertical that is the depth is 2 cm that is almost 4 times and when we place a 70 degree scope we can see the posterior corner, that is the posterior half of the septum. So from the oral cavity, we can see the nose. Such was the volumetric gain. Treatment option for failure. If zeta fails, then what? Repeat dice and decision making. Transpalatal advancement pharyngoplasty, whether we had missed the hard palate lengthening or not, we need to advance that palate in that case. Hyoid suspension or genioplasis advancement and maxillomandibular advancement. Now, candidacy of MMA. I have not showing anything on dome. Dr. Srivash Kishra has wonderfully shown the video. I will show you just selected features of maxillomandibular advancement. When there is severe lateral pharyngeal wall collapse, maxillomandibular advancement is a wonderful technique because we need to understand we advance the maxilla, man, maxilla and mandible, bimaxillary advancement or double bone advancement, double box. This doesn't mean we are actually doing it for epicollapse. Actually, maxillomandibular advancement, tightening the lateral pharyngeal wall. So, lateral pharyngeal wall collapse is a candidacy criteria for MMA. Complete concentric collapse at the level of the velum, which is actually a contraindication for Western wall's hypoglossal nerve pacemaker. Stanford protocol is to do MMA in those cases. And they are actually converting CCC into epicollapse and then do hypoglossal nerve implant. We cannot afford that. They can afford that. And another candidacy is overweight skeletal dental class 2 patients with an AHI of more than equal to 30. And often after unsuccessful UPP or GGA. Exclusion criteria. Exclusion criteria for MMA is MMA is not indicated in patients with complete anteroposterior epiglottic collapse. 
for epiglottis you need to address epiglottis now mma is not an answer for epiglottic so let me skip all this we do lateral cephalogram we do opg routinely let me skip the dice video this is the patient problem list what are the problems when we can think of doing mma large maxilla deficient mandible deficient chin stiff mandibular plane flat occlusal plane and reduced airway we do virtual surgical planning nowadays routinely you can see the flat occlusal plane and the stiff mandibular plane airway is such we do a reconstructive image of the upper airway what are the surgical movement we can plan before the surgery previously there was a making of the uh, processes and, and and the dummy model nowadays vsp is the answer just by doing the vsp we can see the yes maxilla needs 4 mm advancement mandible needs 8.5 mm advancement and advancement genioplasty needs 4 mm advancement that means during the surgery which bone needs how many millimeter of advancement that planning is already at your hand by this virtual surgical planning such is the precision and cutting edge the software guys shows us this is the pre-surgical and this is the expected post-surgical picture so just let me show you select pictures this is the first step patient lying supine then these are the two splints intermediate splint and the final splint i will tell you what is this we do by striker usually surgery starts with bilateral sagittal split osteotomy at the level of the mandible and creating the condylar segment and the dental segment we do the sagittal split osteotomy this is the first step of the leaf foot osteotomy <coughs> and at this step it is fascinating to see how much the maxilla is being mobilized by the spreader This is the first step. Then this is the exposure. Then this is the mobilization. Such was the mobilization. Then we fit, then we place the intermediate splint, means that is actually guide us about the occlusion, which is the most important thing because just by over enthusiastic aggressive advancement, if the patient cannot bite in the post period, you are in a soap. So this splint helps us exactly at which position we will fix our maxillary plates. And these are the fixations. That was the neurovascular pedicle, mandibular pedicle, mandibular nerve. Extremely important to preserve it. Such was the advancement, the mandibular plates. Now this is the advancement genioplasty incision. We plate, place another fixation over there and this is the end result. post care, on table extubation, intensive monitoring overnight in the ICU plus minus, IV antibiotic steroid analgesic, liquid diet from next day orthodontic elastic fitting after three days and soft semi-liquid diet from end of first week complications injury to the descending palate and artery paresthesia of the v3 mental region due to injury of the retraction of the stitching of the inferior alveolar nerve permanent paresthesia has to be avoided temporary paresthesia can happen malocclusion is a dangerous complication and treatment options for failure if even mma fails then CPAP and upper airway stimulation therapy even if MMA fails, then CPAP is the answer and hyperosal nerve pacemaker. And this is my last slide that is updated Stanford sleep surgery protocol. Just the previous protocol of phase 1, phase 2 is no more practice nowadays. Nowadays it is updated Stanford sleep surgery protocol, the Stanley Liu group and the Robson Capasso, that group. They have shifted from the Pavel Little original 
phase one, phase two protocol, that is soft tissue to soft tissue. If fails, then skeletal, that protocol is no more validated. Nowadays, if a particular patient surgical candidacy criteria matches with MMA as a first option, they do MMA as a first option. So, whether soft tissue or skeletal, there should not be any debate. As per the candidacy and as per the patient's requirement, we need a holistic approach. We shouldn't keep any dogma or thought block. Whatever the patient needs, if soft tissue, then soft tissue. If a particular patient needs skeletal as a first option, we need to do skeletal as a first option, be it dome, be it maxillary advancement, be it any kind of rapid maxillary expansion, whatever. Okay. So conclusion, recognizing that multiple levels of ARA obstruction existing OSA is essential to achieve an improvement, must treat all levels of obstruction in an organized and safe manner, and reconstructive surgery rather than destructive surgery is the current concept, just like we have come out of Caldwell Lab and doing face nowadays. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Deepak Dr. Any questions? Hello, Oti.